Good evening. We're on the air once again with uh, another edition of Patience on the News. And I'm delighted tonight uh, to have as our guest Senator Richard Bennett, Main State Senator Rick Bennett, well known to everybody. He's been around for a while, uh, uh, a very smart guy, a guy I happen to admire. And uh, I'm very pleased he's here. Rick, welcome. Thank you so much, Harold. It's a great pleasure to be with you as ever. Thank you. See, mutual admiration society. <laughs> I, was just, uh, I was just telling uh, Rick that uh, as, a, uh, as having a career as a semi-politician with the Democrats and being very active in Democratic politics uh, over the last uh, nearly 60 years, um, I have my problems with the extremes of my party, uh, the people that don't want to compromise, uh, that want it their way or no way, and uh, and I said to him, uh, I like him because he he's a Republican. He's on the other side, and he and I can talk. We can talk. We can. I think good things happen when people do that. Um, and I think it really politics in politics today, we we need to. Remember what Abe Lincoln said in a different context. Time to think anew and to act anew. Our country needs it. But it's hard. And you're up there. You're in the legislature, and uh, you see it every day. I do. You know, I, uh, and I've, I've, I've been outspoken on a few issues. Uh, people may have remembered that, you know, uh, over the last year or so since I got back in office after a long hiatus. Uh, because... I, I think the, the usual dogmas uh, are just not working anymore for Maine people or for people across the country, or probably across the world. And um, we need to kind of break down these barriers that we've created. And I think, um, I think when we do that and we start talking with each other as human beings, we find that we have a lot, of, a lot in common, a lot of the same concerns, a lot of the same aspirations and hopes. And, and actually, uh, I think we can find solutions together. You think we can, but we don't. Uh, we tend not to. I, I you know, sadly, um, you know, I took a long break from from being. Well, yeah, let's involved. go back a yeah. step. When were you first in the legislature? So I was first elected as a young man back when I was 27 years old, 26. I was uh, uh, in the main house, 1990 to 94. Ran for Congress, uh, narrowly lost in 94. Uh, Still in the throes of politics, I, I got elected to the state senate and served from 1996 to 2004. Had the honor of serving as president of the senate in a, when we had that unique tie in the senate where we had an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, one independent. And you, share, you shared the uh, back and forth? We did. Uh, Mike Mishu, later congressman, uh, candidate for govern governor, was the head of the Democratic caucus. I was the head of the Republican caucus at the time, and we did something that nobody expected, which was <laughs> to get along and yeah. find common ground and create a power-sharing arrangement where all senators were treated equally. Um, we all had the same amount of information. We all had an equal voice in, in the process. And it worked out really well for a couple of years. Is that the f only time it's been like that? It's the only time in Maine history that we could find, yeah. It's happened elsewise with mixed results in other jurisdictions, yeah. other states. But then in 2004, I, I, um, I got out of politics, elective office, you know, still an active citizen in ways, but um, focused on building businesses in Maine and also, um, you know, raising my kids who were quite young at the time. and and. Uh, now, in 2020, decided uh, I'd stop yelling at the television and, and <laughs> get back involved and, and uh, uh, won, re uh, won election anew to the uh, state senate in western Maine. So you also have a distinction of being an expert on, sh national expert on shareholder rights and things of that sort and corporate governance, correct? Uh, that's right. I've had the honor of working in that field for a quarter century or more now, um, working with uh, Bob Monks, senior, who um, has long time been a business partner of mine, and Nell Minow, who are the real leaders in the field. Is Nell Minow, she's from Chicago? Originally, yes. And where, was her father the famous Newt Minow? Absolutely. And, yeah. uh, and Newt Minow was JFK's uh, uh, FCC 
commissioner. He was the fellow who, who de declared that television is a vast wasteland. And in fact, a little, a little known fact, um, Gilligan's Island creator called the, the ship the SS Minnow, although it's spelled differently, yeah. in honor of Newton Minnow for him de declaring <laughs> that television is a vast <laughs> wasteland. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you work closely with Nell Minnow? I still do, and yeah. with Bob Monks. We have a firm that uh, helps shareholders, and particularly institutional investors like public pension funds, use the power that they have as owners in the capital markets to uh, to put companies in a better direction so that they serve their shareholders better, their stakeholders better. Before that, we had a s several other enterprises that we worked on t t together in this area, a data company, and, and uh, earlier than that, the first activist investment firm in the country that was doing things like Bill Ackerman and Carl Icahn are doing now regularly. We were doing it back in the 1990s successfully. Uh, taking, posi taking positions in... American corporations in order to force them into a policy direction that... Exactly. Yeah. Be a catalyst for change. Many times these companies were going off the rails uh, and uh, shareholders were suffering. And rather than have, uh, you know, uh, raiders, corporate raiders come in and leverage the company up uh, and, and then, and, and then put, install their own management and then sell it off back to the public market, years later, all making, making money on every step of the way, our theory was, well, why not have the owners, who are often long-term investors like public pension funds and others, uh, why don't they benefit from this? Why can't the agents for them do that service and, and keep that value accretion to the shareholders? So uh, we did that successfully for about 10 years. Uh, we sold that company, started the data company. We're always trying to be on the cutting edge. Um, and that data company, by the way, um, I love, one of the things I love about Maine is they're all, as you see, there, there are so many of these little enterprises. And our company was about 60 people based here in Portland called the Corporate Library. Uh, nobody had a clue what we did. Uh, we didn't, we, we weren't members of the Chamber of Commerce because yeah. we had no customers in Maine. But we were doing world-class work here in Portland, Maine, paying good wages, um, assembling data, putting together risk analytics and selling it to the, the, the biggest investors and, and other stakeholders in, in the country and the world. And um, we, run that, we ran that company successfully. I was the CEO for a period of time and um, eventually sold that company too. But it's, um, I think there's connective tissue, right, between <laughs> the, the work of accountability and power that goes on in the corporate world and the work I try to do as a public uh, servant as well. Yeah, and, and your company uh, really was world class. I mean, it was known throughout the world. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we had uh, you know, the biggest director and officer insurance companies, the, uh, the, the, uh, the credit rating agencies, yeah. uh, the largest investors in the, in the world, um, you know, search firms, uh, law firms, we're all interested in our analytics. And what we would do differently is that uh, traditional financial analysis of companies only explains so much about the risks and performance expectations of the company. Uh, we all know that. Um, in fact, I, I saw a statistic recently that said that the valuation of a public company is only explained about 9% by what you see on the books. So you have another 91% that is, it's intellectual capital. It's the team of talent that people have brought together, the way they govern themselves and hold themselves to account for their performance and compensation, and all of those sorts of things. So we would delve into that and try to find out, well, what is it about the way this board is constructed, a board of directors? Are they actually doing the job? Are they holding management's feet to the fire? Are they paying uh, the CEO his bonus even though he didn't earn it? Those sorts of things which get to the heart of power in corporations. And then we would provide investors and others the tools to use that information, uh, that sort of non-financial information in a way that uh, would add value to their work. And um, it, as it turns out, it's, uh, you know, it's spawned this whole category which is now called ESG, environmental social governance, which some people may have heard of because it's been in the news a lot recently. 
where this non-financial information is very important to every stakeholder in a company to learn how, do, how does a company treat its employees? How is it looking at its, you know, its upstream sourcing, for yeah. example? You know, we hear about a, a, a fire in a factory in Bangladesh, and they would turn out to be making sweatshirts for Nike. And what was Nike's responsibility in making sure that the people in their supply shops in other countries actually were being protected and being served well? So those are the sorts of issues that we would get into. And they, it, it does have, as we see in the news every day, it has a big impact on a company's value because reputation and brand is a key part of a way any company is valued these days. And uh, that can be turned on a dime if, uh, if um, people aren't careful about putting reality and real ethics and values behind their, uh, their stated values. I mean, actually making it real. So we just step back a little and say, okay, well, this guy, this, this is interesting stuff. Uh, <laughs> you grew up in Maine. I did. I was a student at Yarmouth Public Schools. Uh, my dad was an industrial arts teacher. Uh, both my parents come from rural Oxford County. Uh, my mom was uh, worked as a retail sales clerk, eventually retiring from L.L. Bean. Uh, my dad was uh, an apprentice cabinet maker for F.O. Bailey Company, which made cabinets then, didn't sell real estate. Uh, and, um, and then he uh, wanted to be an industrial arts teacher. And so he went to Gorham State Teachers College, and, and uh, he was the first in our family to complete college, eventually went on and got his master's in science and education and a PhD in, in uh, resource planning and conservation and has gone on to be a, a, a university professor and a naturalist and writer of, of note in Maine, still working in books. He's got, I just reviewed one of his books that he asked me to look at uh, this past week and he's got more in the pipeline. So, uh, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a Mainer. Um, Went to the public schools and um, in Yar in Yarmouth High School. I went. I graduated from Yarmouth High School. Yes. Now let me just stop you there. You went to Yarmouth High School, then you went to Harvard. Right. Now I subscribe to a historian's blog that get every day. Heather Cox Richardson. Do you know who she is? I've heard the name. She went to Yarmouth, but then she left and went to Phillips Exeter, okay. and then to Harvard. Got her PhD at Harvard. She's a history professor at Boston College, but she has a blog, and she infuses current events, what's happening every day, uh, she infuses it into a historical context, and it is good, and I'm going to send you a copy oh, of good. it. Email. I made a note here while you were yeah. talking. But <laughs> she's, she's really good, but she's a, she grew up in Yarmouth and went, went to Harvard. Um, okay, so then you went to Harvard, and what did you major in? I majored in government. <laughs> That's what you wanted to major in? Well, I was very interested in, in, uh, in politics and government from a young age. You did model state legislature, boy state, and all that sort of thing. But, you know, in retrospect, I think I would have preferred to, done, to major in something a little bit more uh, esoteric, like the classics. Why the classics? Well, I think we can learn a lot uh, by looking at the people of antiquity and the way they govern themselves, the issues they dealt with. Um, there's a lot of reflections back into our current times. Um, it's just interesting stuff, you know. Uh, there, it's, it seems like another world, but it was very much a human world full of people who had structures and, and systems, not unlike our own in, in form. In fact, you know, the founding fathers created our, our um, constitutional form of government by looking retrospectively at the way Athens and Rome were governed. So I think it's interesting to reflect on, um, reflect on the people of the time and the decisions they made and, and, and how they worked out, how they didn't, and see if there are any, any reflections back to our current time. So you're a Republican. Yes. Lifelong. Yes, indeed. I've uh, been the Republican leader of the Maine State Senate, in the Maine State Senate now, well-known leader, run for governor, 
Congress as a Republican. Uh, I have a maybe a bias. I think I like to think it's not a bias. It's just facts because uh, sometimes facts count. And <laughs> not you, often enough, Harold. Not, <laughs> not often enough. Have you? And, and and in your studies, you paid a lot of attention to facts. You think facts are important. I do, and I, I try my best. But we're all imperfect vessels. <laughs> but well, that's I try. true. That's true. But uh, do you think that Donald Trump won the election and it was stolen from him? I think he won. Uh, th you mean the re-election in, 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 in 2020? Oh, no, he, he uh, lost that election. Do you think that the government has a role to play in trying to get people to get vaccinated to, to try to stop a pandemic? Uh, I do. I do think uh, the government has played a, a big role in making the vaccines available. Um, I don't favor mandates on vaccines. Mm -hmm. I think people need to be convinced to put something in their body. I think the uh, human body is a sovereign territory. And, um, and I, I think there was a little bit uh, too much heavy handedness in mm -hmm. that. So we, we disagree a little bit because um, uh, I remember growing up when polio was a scourge mm -hmm. and the, in every school, they give you polio vaccine. When I was a kid, which was a long time ago, in the 1940s in elementary school, every kid lined up and got a smallpox vaccination. And it was all right. And we got rid of smallpox and we got rid of polio. Yeah. And it was good for society. And none of us ever suffered permanent psychological harm by getting a little pinprick uh, up here. I was in the Navy. And no one said when we got inducted and went through uh, the physical, and they were giving you jabs on both arms, no. no one ever said, wait, wait, I'm a sovereign human being. I get the right to make my own decisions. Don't put that in there. Well, I think when you go to the Navy, you've given up some of your sovereignty. Well, I think when you're a citizen, <laughs> you give up some of it, too. But anyway, so. Um, What your your party is uh, a different party than it was when you first went to the legislature in 1990. Yes, I, and I, I think both parties are, are different in in somewhat subtle ways, but in important ways too. Um, clearly, the world is more polarized. I thought it was kind of polarized back then, but it's gotten worse. Social media has amplified the differences. We have now, uh, in addition, we have uh, whole industries of, you know, political consultants, and, uh, you know, who make vast amounts of money by, not by solving problems, but by keeping the battle alive, you know, so keeping people at each other's throats, keeping, keeping the issues alive. Um, and so uh, all of which is, is I, I think, created a really unfortunate and somewhat toxic uh, environment for trying to do the public's work and policy making. So things have changed a lot since the 1990s. I was in Washington in the 1960s when it was truly bipartisan. Mm -hmm. There was a third party, which was Southern Democrats. And uh, they were basically segregationists. That's what they didn't want a, the clock to move ahead. And um, and they believed in preserving segregation, and and that was the thrust. And so I used, I tell people today, in the Congress, pretty much in those days, pretty much every white supremacist was a Democrat. Today, pretty much every white supremacist in the Congress is a Republican. And uh, it's a fact. It's a fact. It's an in interesting uh, statistic. I looked this up. You go on Wikipedia, you pick any county in America, put it in and ask Wikipedia about the county. They will give you the history of presidential voting in that county. Mm -hmm. So if you pick <clears throat> Neshoba County, Mississippi, which was the real core of Clan work in Mississippi, um, you'll find that Adlai Stevenson 
the left-leaning liberal Democrat who ran in in 52 and 56 yes. against Eisenhower got 70 percent of the vote in Neshoba County, automatic for Democrats. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you pick Dallas County, which is where Selma, Alabama is, uh, same thing. Roosevelt, all of the Truman, except for Truman, the Dixiecrats ran in 48, so he didn't do well. But otherwise, take the 50s, Adlai Stevenson dominated those elections. In 60, Kennedy carried those southern counties. Four years later, we had a Democratic president running in the Democratic South who was a southern Democrat himself, a powerful southern Democrat. He got 10 percent in those counties, 15 percent in those counties. Because of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Correct. Just because of that. And Johnson himself said to Moyers, when M M Moyers reported to him that the second, the Voting Rights Act was, uh, excuse me, the first one, the Public Accommodations Act was passed, he said, Mr. President, you've changed this country. And, and he said, and he was, Moyers was amazed because he wasn't happy, he was happy, but he said, Bill, we've just turned the South over to the Republican Party for my lifetime and yours. They just took over where the Democrats were, just a switch. So a lot of people say, well, you know, don't call me, from the South even, don't call me a racist. Well, when they were Democrats, they were racist. Now they're Republicans, they're not racist. <laughs> so uh, those are just facts. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not asking you to comment on that, but uh, this division and yeah. uh, uh, so, it changed, do you think it changed with Newt Gingrich's elevation in Washington or the method of politics, the method of legislating? I think that, you know, it, this change was manifested in various people um, on both parties uh, over time. And it, certainly the, the Newt Gingrich firebrand style of leadership was a, embl emblematic of it. But I think these, these changes are more aren't just about individual people. Yeah. In fact, the, these leaders, as I like to say, they, the, the political leaders uh, often don't really lead. They just find which way the group is heading and they get out in front of them. So I think that when you see people emerge um, in politics, it's t saying something about our society and the people that constitute it and what their aspirations are, what their needs are. and it's now very easy to segment society. So smaller groups, there, I think there used to be a, a, a push to sort of come together, whether it's in the Democratic Party, or the Republican Party, into a tent, because you all needed each other in order to win the elections. Now it's a more of a free-for-all. You get these small groups that try to gain, uh, you know, and, and will, willing to just like leave the party entirely and often do if they're not satisfied. And so you have the parties become these really un, unhappy concatenations of interest groups that don't necessarily nest neatly together. I mean, a lot of these issues don't need to go together. Um, and so, uh, and then you, you know, you, it, so it's, it's I, I, I really think it's ripe for a, a, a breakdown <laughs> because I don't think it makes logical sense. At the same time, you have the ability of people to reach each other through direct information and find people of like mind so much easier with social media. And so you can see these groups. It's, it's breaking down the traditional institutions all across the landscape, and not just politically, but uh, business um, is breaking down. You've got uh, you, know, you know all the traditional industries and... and um, and, and institutions, I should say, are being subject to uh, reevaluation, and they're being held ac accountable in different ways. And, and you know, that's in universities, it's in the media. Um, there's so much lack of trust about the traditional institutions, and that's leading to this breakdown. Are we going to reassemble into some more 
d different organizational form as a society in the information age? I don't know. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it, we're, th these times are very volatile. And I think um, underlying this is, is you see questioning about our constitutional form of government even, um, and aspects of it, what's working, what isn't. And all these things are you know, deeply troubling um, at some level. Uh, because I think we're closer to chaos than people will credit uh, us often. You know, and we're seeing it. You know, um, every traditionally, you, you know, you, you wouldn't think that uh, Russia would invade Ukraine. It's just sort of unthinkable. I mean, there hasn't been a war of this scale in Europe. Uh, you know, the Balkans were were, were awful in the '90s, uh, but this is like a superpower invading a neighbor um, over NATO. And uh, you, you, you know, we, we thought that we were beyond all that, and, and we're not. You see a volatility in pricing and, and inflationary urges. We all, we all thought that inflation was a thing of the past. It's coming back. Um, so I think you know, it's, it's easy to get sort of comfortable and happy and thinking, oh, we've entered a new age. And then we're reminded by the worst parts of human nature that maybe we haven't. Maybe we're still the same old people after all. David Brooks uh, had a column in uh, mid-February in the New York Times, which is, to me, one of the best columns I ever read. And he said, you know, he's, he, he, he's, a, well, he's a conservative, basically, mm -hmm. but not a Trumper, but a conservative. Uh, and he said in the early 1990s, he was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal in Europe. And all kinds of good things are happening. The Berlin Wall came down. The Soviet Union uh, dissolved. Uh, Oslo made great progress for Middle East peace. Um, and there was German reunification. And democracy was spreading across the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and and now it's all changed. Yeah. What happened? He says, we have an authoritarian strong man in Russia invading his neighbor, as increasingly authoritarian China waging genocide on its people, threatening Taiwan, cyber attacks undermining world order, democracy in retreat worldwide, thuggish populists across the West undermining nations from within. What happened, says Brooks. And he says, I've been reading about James Madison recently, said Brooks. <laughs> and he says, and, and of course, we all know Madison was the political engineer who constructed the United States Constitution, which is the only thing that's held us together. And we came apart. Just as you said, we, we think it can't happen here. In the 1850s, people were at each other's throats in this country over one issue, slavery. Mm -hmm. Those who wanted to preserve the enslavement of other human beings and those who wanted to abolish it. Yeah. Imagine, we came apart at the seams. It ended. The Union split can happen again. Mm -hmm. It can happen again. Passions, all about human passions. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that was a defect um, in the Constitution. The, the founding fathers knew that, that they were papering over this schism. And I think the slavery was, schism. Yeah, and it was just a matter of time for it to emerge in some fashion. And like most people, they probably thought, well, Maybe in a few decades it will take care of itself. And it did with hundreds of thousands of lives lost. 750,000 Americans, basically boys, killed, yeah. gone in the United States. It wasn't the Russians' fault. It wasn't the Chinese' fault. It was us, unable to govern ourselves. It wasn't that long ago. Wasn't that long ago. So this is uh, so this is serious stuff. Yeah, I worry about you know the tendency of people to demonize each other, and 
you know, make moral judgments. You know, where, where you can have a political disagreement, but uh, I get concerned, particularly when I hear people make moral judgments against their, their political adversaries. Because uh, once, you, once you start thinking yourself morally superior, it justifies all sorts of, of horrible things. Um, and I, I hear that creeping up more. Um, you know, I, I used to, when I was party chair, I would go out and talk to, talk to groups. And, and I, you know, back then, they, they were, as always, the Republican Party was like at each other's, you know, with lots of internal disagreements. So I would always end with my remarks by saying, you know, you know I just want to say there's much more that unites us as Republicans than divides us. And everybody thought, oh, yeah, that's good. And then I'd go on to my next statement, which was much on much thinner ice. <laughs> I'd say, in fact, I would say that there's much more that unites us as Republicans and Democrats, as Americans, than divides us. We need to remember that. And I remember, you know, you start to hear people like, well, I don't agree with that. You know, they're, they're the enemy, that kind of thing. And I've heard similar things from some folks on the other side. That there's this n notion that um, that you know we're not worthy people, you know that, that we're making judgments about each other's character, their moral character, and you can do that, but you, you got to remember we're all human beings, and and that's the that's the slippery slope right there is when you when you start demonizing each other, and we're we're beginning to do that. We need to stop it. Well. We, we do demonize e each other. That is abs absolutely correct. Madison, incidentally, had an interesting approach. He was a persuasive guy, and he was the he was the architect of the United States Constitution. He had to get people to agree to things, and he had to deal with people. states' rights were the most important yeah. thing. The thirteen colonies, and each had their own legislatures, and they didn't want much to do with the federal government. They wanted a weak federal government and a strong state government. Yes. He had his troubles putting this, piecing this puzzle and putting it all together. But he had a view that he would never attack anybody personally. He would never condemn a person because of their, their views. He would appeal to their conscience. <laughs> he would appeal to their conscience. So uh, anyway, it, 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 it's a very interesting problem we have. We, you have in the Republican Party uh, many good people that want to be president and so forth, but you have one person who dominates, it dominates. Why can't, or maybe you don't have an answer to this, this is a bit, but why can't some of those other people, re Republicans who want to be president, why can't they get a foothold? Because one person is so popular, perhaps the most popular in his party of anybody since Franklin Roosevelt was so popular in the Democratic Party. I think that, uh, that we're going to see competition over the next couple of years uh, for leadership, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, there's some governors of states that are, um, you know, they're, they're making themselves known, I think. Um, that uh, you know, Donald Trump has clearly a, uh, a, a huge following. I see it when I speak to Republican groups. Um, I think the in, in, here in Maine, you know, it's um, uh, there are there are people. I think it's a subset uh, that think that he won the election. Um, I think you know he's been successful in, in conveying that to to some people. But I do think this issue with respect to his um, treatment of Russia and now the, the, the unmasking, as if he needed to be unmasked, <laughs> but the unmasking of Vladimir Putin and who he is and what his regime means for not only world stability but, and the safety of, of neighboring uh, countries, but also for the people of Russia. I think all of that is something which is going to force a reevaluation of, of Donald Trump. Uh, and I think there will be Republican leaders that come out and present themselves um, with, 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 you know, to, to try to assume the mantle of leadership to be the Republican presidential nominee in 2024. Very unhappy. Uh, you know, I served on the National Committee and was really unhappy to see 
the RNC take the position they did a, a, a couple months ago, uh, where they intervened in Lynn Cheney's primary, and um, you know, it's, it, I don't think it's the role of party leaders to tell Republican members, their, their members of their party, how they should vote on anything. I've never felt that way. I think that you know, leadership involves um, service and following people and being and getting direction. And um, that, I think that was just wrong-headed. And they you know, essentially made themselves, as we enter the 2024 cycle for election, um, you know, they, they took a position for Donald Trump with that, with that action. I thought that was really unfortunate. It is unfortunate, but they, they firmly support. I mean, the, the party establishment firmly supports uh, uh, Donald Trump, and you suggest that maybe Putin and uh, and how he's been unmasked uh, will have some deleterious effect on the popularity of Donald Trump in the Republican Party. But Tucker Carlson, see Tucker Carlson in your district, do your district go up to Brian it, Pond? It does not, but Brian Pond is where my mom comes from. So um, okay, and I have. Uh, a nice cottage on the same lake that Tucker has. Do you know place. Tucker Carlson? I've met him. Yeah. And ran into him in the local uh, uh, corner store there. Right. He's a Putin defender, too. And uh, and I think he's a Putin, he may be a Putin defender because Trump is. But what, how could that hurt Trump? I don't, I don't know how it, how it, how it hurts him. I mean, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, we live in a continuum, and events happen, and people rise, and they fall, and, they, and movements come and go, and I, I you know, I just, I, I've, I've actually given up political prognostication, because <laughs> yeah. it's a fool's errand <laughs> these yeah. days. It's just, I don't, I really don't know where we're heading. Um, it, it, but again, I, I, I try not to focus on personality. And I don't focus I, I focus, I try to focus more on policy, direction of our country. I think there's so much distraction about personality. Um, you know, it, there's nobody that wants everybody to be talking about Donald Trump more than Donald Trump. No question about so, that. Uh, He's good at and, that. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of people that make loads of money on both sides of the aisle talking incessantly about Donald Trump. I prefer to focus my energies on, on issues that I think are really important to Maine people. And that, that's why I've, um, I, I've taken some positions that people scratch their head and say, like, you know, that isn't a very conventional Republican position. <laughs> but I, I think it's time that we, as I said, think anew and act anew. Um, you know, it's a shortcut to sort of put somebody in a bucket about being pro-Trump or anti-Trump. What we should be doing is just thinking about what, where we want to go as a people and what's the best path to get us there uh, on a whole host of policy issues. Energy, education, um, uh, there's, you know, transportation, um, the environment. There's so many cross currents that I think people need to focus on, and it's easy just to like get caught up in the in the the personalities of the moment. Meanwhile, um, you know the house is burning. <laughs> it's 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 pretty bad. I, I've been involved in a ballot measure, uh, and and you've you've supported it, and I appreciate that. Protect Maine elections. Uh, you, you know we. I'm thinking about Russia when I say this, because Russia uh, has spent an ungodly amount of money in, um, in fact, I, I have the number here. Russia has spent um, $182 million in recent years influencing policy in the U.S., laying the groundwork for their invasion of Ukraine. Um, th there are so many foreign actors that are getting access to our very open political system here through money, uh, through loopholes in campaign spending law that we need to close so that elections can be about Mainers' interests, about Americans' interests, 
not uh, susceptible to foreign influence. And so I put a bill in the legislature that got uh, broad bipartisan support, actually enacted, um, to uh, stop foreign meddling in our referendum campaigns, which is totally legal in Maine. It's not in many other states. The, F the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, just said that they don't have any regulatory authority over this. You mean that foreign, foreign governments, foreigners can put as much money as they want? Foreign in the corporations, main... but also foreign governments. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the most recent example of that, and the reason the governor vetoed the bill, uh, I think, was that uh, she tied it up with the, the ongoing uh, question of the CMP corridor, which the, uh, was supported, uh, or I should say, the, the question at the ballot uh, was opposed by Hydro-Quebec, who uh, is a crown corporation owned 100 percent by the province of Quebec, Canada, a, a foreign government. They spent $22 million, an unprecedented sum, in trying to influence that election. Uh, my bill didn't deal with that. It was forward-looking. <laughs> But uh, I think the governor was concerned about, you know, the, uh, signing the bill in the context of that campaign. So she vetoed it. We failed an override by one vote. We're now sending it out to the voters for, um, we're, we're collecting signatures. We're over halfway there now to put it on the ballot. Along with that, we have part of the bill which calls upon Maine's congressional delegation to overturn Citizens United because we need to stop this, the, we, we need to make elections equal for citizens. And when you treat corporations as a citizen, uh, you know, the citizen of ExxonMobil is going un, un, to outgun um, a resident of, of Freiburg, Maine, any day of the week. So w we need to deal with this, this chronic and, and um, deep and serious problem of money in politics. And, um, and so what, we need to tackle that. And it should be a bipartisan uh, approach, like we're, we're doing, uh, we did in the main legislature. Would you say it should now. be a bipartisan approach from money in politics? Yes. But it doesn't seem to be. I think it is. I mean, I think, the, first of all, the problem is clearly with both sides. I mean, everybody's taking money from well, the Well, everybody wants office. money. But the, but the lefties would like to, I mean, I was on the, National Governing Board of Common Cause for nine years in Washington, and they pressed hard on this issue of money in politics. But I do know for a fact, not you, you're on the Common Cause side. You know, I mean, you're against mon money and a lot of money in politics and influencing public policy. So, but th in Washington, there's a lot of leading Republicans that are against it. That's why uh, it's so hard to r overturn legislatively Citizens United. Not only that, but we had McCain-Feingold, which was struck down. We had, I mean, even our two moderate Republican senators voted against uh, uh, the bill that would overturn Citizens United. So it's it's hard. I'm not saying that the Republicans are bad because of that. But <laughs> I, I'm saying you're a Republican. You're good because your position I agree with. <laughs> well, um, but but it, it is. It, we got to. I don't know how we convince them. It's okay to r regulate this. Yeah, there there's a strong current of um, you know thinking what uh, just distrusting any sort of regulation on the Republican side. And it's, it's not a, sometimes it's not a bad inclination, but I think on sometimes some of these big not. issues, um, I think Republicans get played uh, by powerful interests. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've come out, uh, another issue is um, kind of radical for Republican uh, in some ways, but over a long period of study, I, I've come out in favor of a consumer-owned utility to replace our investor-owned utilities, CMP and Versant. Uh, most people don't know that CMP and Versant are owned by foreign <laughs> investors. Right. Versant, the old Bangor Hydro, is actually owned by a foreign government, the city of Calgary, Canada. Yeah. Um, CMP is owned ultimately by Ibedrola, who is a Spanish conglomerate, which in turn, most the two largest owners of Ibedrola of the governments of Norway, uh, not Norway, Maine, Norway, the country, and Qatar. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
I think people have lost a lot with globalization. And I think people are realizing that. And they're all for free markets. They're all, for, but the, the issue is that they, they're losing power. They're losing the, the, the right to self-determination. And it's not getting the job done. When you have natural monopolies like our electric utilities um, owned by foreign actors, it, it uh, doesn't work. And we've seen the results. So, incidentally, back to you know personalities. The problem is that much of human history is about individual personalities, much of human history. And uh, democracy, a little less. But uh, because it, it is government by the people, ostensibly. Uh, Brooks, back to David Brooks and his column in mid-February. I want your comment on this. Brooks says, many of America's founders were fervent believers in liberal democracy. Not the liberal, where Republicans say, you libs. That's not what the liberal were talking Classical about. Democracy. Classical democracy. Classical yeah. democracy. He, and they were fervent believers in, in liberal democracy up to a point. They had profound respect for individual virtue, but also for individual frailty, personality. Mm -hmm. Personality can be virtuous or it can be frail. Samuel Adams said, ambitions and lust for power are predominant passions in the breasts of most men. You've been in politics a long time. You've seen, you met a lot of politicians. You don't disagree with that. I do not disagree with that in the <laughs> least. I don't think anybody would. I'm just reading the news. <laughs> Patrick Henry admitted to feelings of dread when he contemplated the depravity of human nature. One delegate to the Constitutional Convention said that the people lack information and are constantly liable to be misled liable to be misled. Our founders, said Brooks, were aware that majorities are easily led by demagogues. So you're aware of these mm. issues and problems and want the public to be aware of them, right? They've been a problem in, in human history for millennia. <laughs> and they are always, and we need to create institutions that will account for these uh, issues of human nature. And the guardrails that Madison and the people who designed the Constitution, yeah. uh, checks and balances, are guardrails for making sure that, not, that, that power is diffused a little. But uh, it has nothing to do with the nature of people, leaders who get power and like Putin, and I say like demagogues, and we've had one, more than one in our human history, in our country's history, uh, that you, you build these guardrails uh, in order to check passion and prejudice. But Madison said, and he learned this from his mentor, who was the president of Princeton at the time he was there, uh -huh. Religion has a lot, a big role to play in terms of conscience, in terms of what's right and wrong, in terms of governing passions that get out of control. Religion, government can't do it all. So, <laughs> he said, one guy said, Madison and his cohorts designed a constitution, but it was a constitution for fallen people. In other words, Mm -hmm. These people could get out of control. Do you agree with that, that things oh, could get surely. out of control? I mean, I, I just, I, I know how much my faith helps guide me um, and hope, hopefully uh, better my judgment, uh, increase my tolerance, my love of other people, uh, the way I interact with them. I, I, I try to uh, live up to the standards of my faith. Uh, I'm a Christian who, uh, uh, is a, a member, my wife and I, of the Congregational Church up in South Paris. I like the Congregational Church because it's, uh, 
you know, it's, it's founded on the line in Matthew that, you know, if two or more gather my name, uh, I am there. So the sense is that... Well, if you belong to the liberal church. <laughs> <laughs> the sense is that it's not hierarchical. Yeah. The, the power of the church is based on two people coming together. So a congregation is the ultimate source. But it's source. accepting it's not, of people who are different than you. It's based on love. It's based on uh, the, the commandment of Jesus to love thy neighbor. Uh, as thyself, and I, I think you know we could all, whether you adopt that that faith or not. I think that in, this is a this is a sentiment which is carried through in many of the world's major religions, and I so I, I agree. Regardless of your faith family, I think thinking about uh, the, the the bigger picture is always helpful. Brooks addressed what you just addressed. I'm going to you to react to this. Brooks says, Madison and his colleagues designed a series of checks and balances which they hoped would protect against abuses of political power. But, says Brooks, the founders recognized that a much more important set of civic practices would mold people to be capable of being self-governing citizens. Churches mold people to be capable of being self-governing. Churches were meant to teach virtue. Leaders were to receive classical education. You said you often wished that you had received classical <laughs> education. Leaders were re to receive classical education so they might understand human virtue and vice and the fragility of democracy. Patriotic rituals were observed to instill share love, shared love of country. I think the guy's right on myself. Mm. So you, you've talked about yourself, mm -hmm. and you fit into what he's talking about. Well, uh, you're, I, I, <laughs> I don't know how to react to that, except that I, I do think that um, I think there's a lot of shared um, perspective. As I said, you know, I, I, what, a lot of what you're talking about there it, it, are shared by many Americans. Yes. And we kind of lose, we lose sight of that. Uh, and we lose, The majority for sure. And, and we are governed by these fleeting passions, often fleeting. I mean, I had, you know, uh, I get issues that like stir me up, you know, for a, a while. Sometimes it's days on end, sometimes it's years on end, and sometimes it's a few seconds. And, and I think we just need to um, balance ourselves, right? And, and remember what is uh, important and, re and remind ourselves that we're all in this journey together. You know, it's, this is a shared experience and we need to be respectful of each other. We're, uh, we need to give each other elbow room. We need to tolerate differences. We need to, we need to listen to each other. Um, we, we shouldn't believe everything we read on social media. We should give people the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> very, very good advice. And, and, and I want to finish what, what, what Brooke said because I think mm -hmm. I'd be interested in your comment because I think it fits with what you just said. He said... Uh, he, 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 he went on. He talked about the churches. He talked about the patriotic rituals, which were important. He said newspapers and magazines were there to create a well-informed citizenry. Etiquette rules, etiquette rules and democratic manners were adopted. And it's true. They became part of our fabric, a way of governing with certain, yeah. certain rules, unwritten rules about how you behave as a politician to encourage social equality and mutual respect. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. And then he says, this is a little bit of a downer, <laughs> over the past few generations, that hopeful but sober view of human nature has faded. Narcissism, he says, it's all about me. Human beings think they should be unshackled from restraint. But you're talking about the importance of restraint. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the, um, that 
we should all be restrained <laughs> because, uh, and I do think it's, it, it, is, it is a common courtesy. I mean, like, treat people like you want to be treated. It's golden rule stuff. I mean, it's not very complicated. Um, and it's easy to get away from. And there, you're, you're, all, of the, all of the passions are, are tugging people in, away from that these days. And I do think that we're, we've lost some moorings on keeping there. Um, and we each need to find the way to, to, uh, to keep, keep the balance, keep the moorings. Uh, and and it, politics is no different from a lot of other places here. I mean, professions have lost um, the, lot, much of their integrity. You know, we, we saw through the uh, recent corporate events, for example, that, uh, you know, the legal profession and the accounting profession, you know, they, they, they were called professions because they, they, because it was something that you professed. It was a, res there were responsibilities involved with it. It wasn't just transactional. And I think one of the expressions commercially for what you're talking about is the increasing transactional nature of, of people. They're looking out and trying to get the best deal. They're trying to, you know, get, get, uh, you, you know, you can't, you can't win without somebody else losing, that sort of thing. And it's, it's, it's a problem across, across the spectrum, not just in politics. You can't win without somebody else losing. I think you've hit on something, Rick. A problem is we think it's a zero-sum game. People think it's a, if that person <laughs> gets ahead, I'm bound to lose. Yeah. I think that's part of the race problem. If you're trying to help these people get ahead, that must mean that I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose status. I'm going to lose my position in life. I don't know how we get over that zero-sum game business, but, but your advice is good advice. Yeah, it's, it's distressing because I think the whole American project is based on the idea that, um, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. When we start thinking that there's only one pie and we need to grab our piece of it, and that we can't create a bigger pie by working together, living together, uh, recreating together, and, and, living, and, and, and engaging in society as a, uh, together. Um, that, that's a real foundational problem. That's a great place to end this program. I really appreciate your being here. Harold, it's always wonderful to talk with you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much.